Minecraft, Spelunky, Civilization. What do all of these games have in common? They're all games that have a seemingly limitless amount of content, and you can play for hundreds of hours without it getting repetitive. Why? Because all of these games make use of procedural generation using computer algorithms to produce content that is different every time, rather than designing everything by hand. Procedural generation is a powerful tool that, if used correctly, can take a game from good to great and keep players coming back over and over again. In today's video, we will begin exploring the topic of procedural generation by taking a look at 3D terrain generation, how it works and why it's used. To do so, we'll actually be coding a procedurally generated 3D landscape from scratch. To make our 3D landscape, I'm going to be using a program called Processing, which is basically a programming environment that makes it really easy to draw things to the screen. While I will be explaining what I'm doing as I go, this video is meant more to explain the tools and techniques behind terrain generation rather than being a step-by-step how-to guide. Without further ado, let's get started. Let's start by getting our project set up. Processing projects are called sketches, and every sketch needs two functions. You have a setup function, which is called once at the beginning of the program. Uh, the main thing that we actually need to set up in our setup function is our screen size. So we'll do 600 by 600. And we can also set the renderer that we're gonna be using. Because this is a 3D program, we're gonna use the P3D renderer. The second function is the draw function, which is actually called over and over. Uh, let's start by just picking a random background color and then we'll see what our window looks like. All right, we got this nice uh, purple background here, but not the most exciting thing. Let's see what else we can do. The first step to getting something more interesting is to make some noise, <laughs> literally. Noise is a special form of randomness with some very useful properties. Uh, to demonstrate this, let's do a little side by side. First, I'm gonna fill the screen with randomness and then I'll fill it with noise and we can see why noise is so nice. My screen, like most screens, including the one you're watching this on, is made of pixels. For this demonstration, I'm gonna go through each of those pixels one by one and assign it a random color between black and white. When I say random, I mean that there's an equal chance of any pixel having any value from black to white to anywhere in between. Uh, I just need to loop through all the horizontal pixels, loop through the vertical pixels, and voila. All right, as you can see, we have a bit of a salt and pepper storm on our hands. <laughs> so this is what true randomness looks like. Every pixel is completely independent of all the other pixels. It's just absolute chaos. This is generally not what you want when you're actually doing procedural generation. So let's see what happens if I replace the random function with a noise function instead. Noise only produces a value between zero and one, whereas random actually produces a value uh, between zero and whatever we, number we put here, uh, in this case, 255. So if we want them to match, we're just gonna have to multiply the noise value that we get by 255. Okay, now let's give that a look. As you can see, we have a, a much more structured uh, repeating pattern. However, this still isn't what we want. So we're actually gonna wanna zoom in a lot closer. This is kind of a really zoomed out view of the noise. So let's uh, get a closer look here. All right, so in order to do that, I'm gonna create a variable called increment and let's set that to something small, like 0.05. Now here, when I'm getting my noise value, instead of just getting X and Y, I'm gonna get X times increment and y times increment. Okay, so now by multiplying these increments by these small numbers, uh, every time I take a step, I'm not moving a whole pixel to the right, I'm just moving a tiny, tiny little bit, which is basically going to zoom in on that big repeating pattern that we had, 
So we just see a, a smaller portion of it. All right, okay, that's a lot more interesting, right? So now that we have something to look at, let's talk a little bit about what noise is and the noise function. So noise is basically controlled randomness. As you can see, the colors still vary from black to white with all of the shades of gray in between, much like we had when we were doing random. However, it isn't as harsh as when it was purely random, and the reason is because the pixels aren't independent anymore. Pixels actually depend on the pixels next to them. So instead of just going directly from black to white, it goes smoothly through the different shades of gray in between. So the specific type of noise that processing uses for its noise function is called Perlin noise. And if you're interested in learning more of the specifics of how it works, I would definitely recommend Coding Train, which has a whole series that goes in much more in depth. However, for the purposes of this video, all we really need to know is that it produces a kind of smooth, uniform randomness that is much more useful for procedurally generated terrain, textures, and so forth. Another nice thing about noise is that it's repeatable. Noise is all based on a special number called a seed. Different seeds will give you different noise patterns, but using the same seed over and over again will give you the same result every time. In fact, you remember when we were looking at the random pixels, it, they were flashing, they were changing. That's because draw is a loop and it's constantly re-looping through the same values. That they're doing the same thing here for the noise function, but because it's all using the same seed, we're going to keep getting the same result each time, which is why it looks like a still image. But it's actually looping through this, and I should probably tell it not to, because that's a bit of a waste of processing power. But that's okay. So because noise relies on a seed, that means that we can tell it exactly what seed we want, and then we'll always get the same result every time. So let's set our seed to something nice. Let's say... Very special number. So Perlin noise is only one of many different kinds of noise algorithms that we can use depending on what kind of look you're going for. But for the purposes of this video, we're just gonna be sticking with Perlin noise. That being said, one of the other major benefits of noise algorithms is that they're really customizable. We already showed what happens when you zoom in and out on Perlin noise, but there are lots of other things we can do that change how it looks. For example, we can change the level of detail on our noise by using the noise detail function. So the noise detail function takes two numbers. The first determines how many layers of Perlin noise we want to generate, and the second determines how the layers get added together. The more layers of noise we add, the grittier the result. The default is four layers. So let's take a look and see what happens if we drop it down to just one. The result looks a lot smoother. It almost looks as if it's been blurred. Now, let's try cranking it up to 8 and see what happens. Now it's got a lot more fine, gritty details. Uh, for the purposes of this video, I think we're going to stick to three. Three different layers of noise that should do uh, fine for what we need it to. There are lots of other ways that we can play with the results and the different variables with the noise, but we'll explore more of those after we get our terrain working. After all, all we really have now is some fuzzy shapes in 2D, a far cry from 3D terrain. True, but what if instead of using the noise to get colors, we instead used it to get a height value? A 2D image used to produce a 3D surface is called a height map, and height maps have been used to generate 3D terrain for decades now. So let's quickly modify our project to turn our surface into a height map. The first thing we need to do is create a flat mesh. All virtual 3D objects are made up of meshes, which are basically the points, edges, and triangles that make up the object. All meshes are basically made up of triangles because triangles are the simplest shape, so for our mesh we first need to create a bunch of triangles. To do this, I'll be creating what processing calls a triangle strip, and I'm basically just going to be creating a bunch of rows and columns of triangles. 
Okay, so here's our triangle strip. It looks like I maybe have an off by one error over here on the right, but that's okay. Um, it's maybe a little hard to tell, but this is basically a, a grid of little tiny triangles just covering the screen. And those are the triangles that we're going to use to create our terrain with. So right now we're not using our noise yet, but we're going to bring it all together. Alright, so our grid is nice and everything, but right now it's pretty flat, right? There's nothing really interesting going on with it because all of our uh, triangles have the same Z value. They have the same height, uh, which in this case is actually zero. So what we want to do is we want to actually change the height of our uh, triangles based on our noise values. For each of our vertices, we actually need to get the height value based on the noise of that coordinate and use that to adjust our height. All okay, already this is starting to look much more interesting, right? You can already tell uh, there's not really any shading in this, but just the way that the different grid lines come together, you can already see kind of the wavy, curvy shapes that this is giving us, right? Because we're getting different height values for different parts of the landscape. Um, however, uh, right now it's a little hard to tell exactly what's going on because we're really looking down on it from above. So I think this would be a lot easier to see what's really going on if we looked at it on the side rather than from above. So to change our perspective, there, we only really need to add a few quick lines of code. The first thing that we need to do is actually move our image down a little bit and then we're just going to rotate it around our x-axis and that's going to give us a much better perspective on what's actually happening. So this is actually the exact same landscape that we were just looking at before but from a different perspective and as you can see it already looks like uh, you know some kind of rocky hilly mountainy terrain. But, I, of course, we have a long ways to go before we get some, some really interesting landscapes. But, now that we technically have our landscape and it's ready to go, I'm going to quickly add a few lines of code from a previous project just for demonstration purposes. Uh, it's a little bit of cheating, but here, it'll just go really quick. So, what I'm adding right here is basically just going to add some color to our landscape instead of being completely, you know, black and white. This last little bit of code that I'm adding, this is actually some control code, which is going to allow us to move through our landscape, which is really going to help demonstrate some positive aspects, but also some problems with the terrain that we have right now. All right, uh, so now we're actually going to have something kind of neat. Not only do we have our landscape and it's, you know, more colorful, more interesting to look at, I would say, it's also, uh, we can move around through it, we can fly through it, right? So now, in only, you know, 10, 15, whatever it's been minutes, we have a 3D procedurally generated landscape with color that we can actually move around and explore in. That's, that's pretty neat. But we are not done yet. By looking around, we can actually notice a few problems with what we see here. Sure, this is decently convincing mountain terrain, but because everything is using the same noise function, everything in the world is actually going to look like this, right? There's not going to be a lot of variety in the terrain. Uh, especially because the noise function that we're using actually repeats. Uh, if you remember when we were kind of zoomed out more, it repeated, it, it was a kind of a regular pattern, which is not really what you want for a procedurally generated world, right? You want infinite variety. So one way to add more variety to our virtual landscape is to have multiple different noises that control different aspects of the world, right? One noise may control the surface displacement or the height, which is what we have now, while another could control other things like temperature. So let's go ahead and add a second noise value that controls what type of terrain we'll actually be creating. And specifically for demonstration purposes, we're going to create a kind of a flat, gentle landscape with hills, and then we're going to have a more jagged, mountainy terrain. 
To do this, we're actually gonna have to take our noise into the third dimension, right? Right now we have two dimensional noise where it takes an X value and a Y value, but noise can actually have any number of dimensions, right? It can be three, four, or even higher number of dimensions. So our old noise, we'll just set a Z value and we'll just set that to zero. Okay, so here's our new landscape. Let's just move around. And uh, the main thing we want to notice here, though, is that as the landscape gets darker, right, here's a dark patch, and it's pretty flat and smooth, right? As the landscape gets lighter, we start to get some kind of bigger, rougher mountains. Yeah, so there's a good example, right? Flatter, darker patch, and then it starts to get lighter, and it starts to get uh, more mountainy. So right now it's not terrible, but it's still not the most impressive. After all, it's just different heights of hills. Still, you could use this technique to determine all sorts of different things. You could have noises to determine things like vegetation, rainfall, different types of, of rocks or soil. And you have all these different kinds of noises layered together, it's gonna create a much more vibrant, detailed result. And because you have different noises at different scales all layered together, it's gonna take a much longer time before it starts to repeat itself. Whereas with just a single noise, it's gonna end up getting repetitive pretty quickly. By layering three or four noises together, you have a basically infinite variety of different possibilities. So there's one last trick I wanna show you guys, and then I wanna discuss some of the weaknesses of this approach. So up until this point, we've basically just been using the noise values as is, but you can also get a lot of interesting results by messing with the values themselves before you use them. So one really simple example I want to show is using the absolute value of the noise instead of just the noise itself. Alright, here's something pretty interesting. So the way that the absolute value works, anytime you go from positive to negative, it's basically going to create these kind of creases, right? It's going to create kind of a sharp line anytime you cross zero. So now that we have those sharp creases in our graph, that's going to give us these kind of interesting rivers and paths through our noise, which I think is a, a really interesting effect. And we still have our different kinds of terrain, right? We still have our, our flatter terrain with our rivers, and then we can get into the more mountainy areas. So now this gives us a lot more variety in our world, and we get some, some really interesting looks. Like, this is starting to be a real terrain generation algorithm. And this is only one of the many different effects you can get by messing with your noise function. By changing the level of detail of the noise, zooming in and out, layering different noises upon each other, and applying different mathematical functions to the noise, there's an infinite number of different effects you can create. For example, let's see what this same terrain looks like with a higher level of detail. We'll move it from 3 to, let's say, 6. Now that's a very different effect from what we were getting before. And the interesting thing about this is you could even set it up so that different areas of your world have different levels of detail, right? You could have some kind of smoother hilly areas. You could have some more jagged mountainy areas. The possibilities are really endless. This technique does have some limitations, however. Because we're basically just raising and lowering the height of the landscape, we can't get those three-dimensional details like overhangs, arches, caves, or anything that's not just raising and lowering the height, basically. However, there are ways around this. We've just been working with two-dimensional noise, but you can actually create three-dimensional landscapes out of 3D noise entirely, I don't have time to write a renderer for 3D noise right now, but maybe in a future video, we'll see. Uh, another way to get around this is to generate your height map, turn it into a 3D mesh, and then have a separate pass to add your three-dimensional details. The second pass can be used to remove parts of your mesh for caves and overhangs, 
or it can even add things to it, such as natural arches. There's so much more to talk about on this topic, but I think that's gonna do it for this video. If you like this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe so you don't miss more programming and procedural generation videos in the future. If you found this video interesting, you should check out more of my channel. I cover all kinds of different topics in the realms of game design and programming. You can also check out the Rempton Games blog, which has over 150 articles at the link in the description down below. And join me next week where we'll be applying what we learned today to find out how Minecraft generates its worlds. Until then, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.